live sessions with you guys. Tonight we're going to be doing a pool bonding master class. We're going to give a little bit of time for those who will get online. It takes a few minutes for everybody to get the notification and jump online with us. Hopefully here in just a moment I'll see that we are live and be able to make sure that we're getting good audio. And uh, you guys are really great about helping me with that as well. Hopefully my phone will notify me here in just a second that we are live. Because that means you guys also got the notifications. And it says we have one viewer right now. Let's go ahead and refresh the page, see if everything's working. If you guys want to drop in the chat that we've got good audio, even just a thumbs up would be very helpful. Looks like you can see me on the screen there. Man, I'm really enjoying these live sessions with you all. It's a different way for us to get together and interact. You guys know in my videos, I like to bring you the juice. Uh, one thing about the live sessions, there is a little bit of you know, fluff, you could say, in the videos, but it's a little more personal. And when we go back to our normal schedule here in the fall, there'll be no fluff. We're going to go back to process after process, code after code, how we normally do it. If you guys could give me a thumbs up and let me know that you have good audio... I would greatly appreciate that. For some reason, I did not get the notification that we went live, but it looks like there it is. All right. We've got some audio. It's kind of crazy how little delay there is. I mean, it's just a few seconds delay from live to your living room. So I think that's pretty cool. Tonight, we're going to do a pool bonding master class. I love teaching this lesson. I've not taught it in a little while, so we'll have to kind of just work with me. Appreciate you, TK. But this is a super crucial lesson. It's one of my favorite lessons to teach. And if you've not watched my Pool Bonding 101 video, this is going to be some juice for you. If you have watched my Pool Bonding 101 video, there's nothing like watching things live. Uh, just a different atmosphere and a different set of things get done when you do something live. We're going to wait here just a couple minutes. What's going on, Lewis? It is cool. Appreciate you, bro. And what's up, Jesus? What's going on, brother? From Idaho. Good to hear from you, brother. And we're going to wait just a couple minutes and get, just jump right into the lesson. So I'm going to get us set up on the screen. So bear with me just a second. We're going to go ahead and... Move this above this, and if we shrink that up to here, we don't need to see a bunch of my face. Then we got to do the device capture. Hopefully, you guys can see me. All right, display capture. There it is. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get the lesson queued up here, get ready for it tonight. Hmm, it's doing it again. Give me just a second. I don't know why it thinks I have multiple displays on this. Let me turn this off for just a second. Give me just a second, guys. had another HDMI cord plugged in and my PowerPoint for some reason keeps wanting to work off of that one that's plugged in and it doesn't even have a device to it. So let's give this another whirl. If not, I do know how to fix it. Boom, we're ready. All right, if you guys want to shout out, we got 17 watching live. I love going live with you guys where we can interact, we can talk about the code. If you've got any code questions, drop them down in there. If you want to let us know what state you're in, what you're doing right now, are you hanging out in your ball shorts at the house, are you still on the job site, what time is it where you're at, what part of the country you're in, if you guys want to drop all that cool stuff down in the chat, it's pretty cool. If you're watching this later on and it's not live, you can actually click that live chat button and it'll show you everything that we talked about while we were live. 
Let's go ahead and dive into the lesson. Hey, everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach, and this is our Pool Bonding 101 lesson. It's all about pool bonding, and this is a master class. We're going to go through it step by step and cover the fundamentals. This may be all review for you, and that's okay. There's nothing like going back to the basics. Just like in basketball, we go back to the dribbling and the shooting, the dribbling and the shooting. And as long as we work on those fundamentals, we'll always be sharp. This class might be totally radical for you and a complete mind blower, but that's okay. Sometimes you've got to get your mind blown in order to get your mind right, in order to move up and level up in the field. So no matter where you're at on that spectrum, I'm glad that you're here today. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I've dedicated my life to help you become everything that you can be in life and in the electrical industry. If there's anything you ever need from me, you can always just email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it. This is our Pool Bonding 101 series. We're going to learn about equipotential bonding. What does it mean and why do we do it? We're going to learn about why we bond. We're going to learn what to bond tonight. Very tactical, boots on the ground, getting stuff done. We're going to learn methods for bonding. It's one thing to understand intellectually what we're doing or even understand how to do it, but we're going to learn about those different methods that you can use. One thing I love about the electrical industry is there's so many different ways that we can legally accomplish the same thing. And if you go three counties over, they might accomplish it a different way. And there's nothing wrong with any individual way that we do it. First thing that we have to define is a permanently installed pool. The definitions in the NEC are very important. Some are more important than others. This is a very important definition because if your pool meets the definition of a permanently installed pool, all of the codes in part one, two, and three that have to do with permanently installed pools, and I think there's even a part four, but the whole 680 that has to do with permanently installed pools applies to you. If it's not a permanently installed pool and it's a portable or storable pool, then only those rules apply to you along with anything else that gets laid out for you that does apply in 680. But when you meet that threshold of permanently installed pool, all the requirements for a permanently installed pool are now activated. Regardless of the shape of the pool or whether or not an above ground pool is required, we're going to learn that tonight and why it's so important to understand this definition. Now, when we go and read the definition, I'm going to be paraphrasing all of my code tonight. You need to go to, to directly to the NEC. But it says here in the beginning of Article 680, in the dot two section is where we're going to find our definitions. All the way up to the 2023 code, if there were specific definitions that applied only to that article, they would be in the dot two section of that article. So in Article 680 is Section 680.2, and that's where the definitions that only apply to 680 are listed. All of the general definitions are listed back in Article 100. Let's go to the definition in 680.2 of a permanently installed pool. Permanently, uh, a permanently installed immersion, waiting, or therapeutic type pool. Those that are constructed, that are in ground, or that are constructed partially in ground. And we're going to cover it all here in a minute. And all other swimming pools, immersion, wading, therapeutic pools that are capable of, of holding a depth of 42 inches, of greater than 42 inches, and all pools that are installed inside of a building. Now, it's hard sometimes to paraphrase the NEC, but I'm getting ready to recap for you. Any pool that is constructed in ground or partially in ground is automatically classified as a permanently installed pool. You say, what does partially in ground mean? Well, here in East Tennessee, there's not a lot of flat yards. And even if you have a flat yard, if you dig down the grades like this, so if you were to put your pool here and dig down the six inches just to put your sand, a portion of that pool is going to be underground. It's very common in here. You could have a grade like this where the front of the pool you can walk onto and the back of the pool is three foot underground. So any pool that is in ground or partially in ground is going to instantly be classified as a permanent pool regardless of depth. Any other pool that's capable of holding greater than 42 inches is instantly now and in above, uh, not an above ground pool. It doesn't matter if it's above ground, below, whatever. And it doesn't matter if it's plastic or inflatable. If it's capable of holding 43 inches or larger, 
greater than 42 inches, technically 42 and a quarter inches. If it's greater than 42 inches, it's now classified as a permanently installed pool. And all pools that are inside of a building, oddly enough, are instantly classified as a permanently installed pool. You say, Coach, why does this matter? Like I said, I want to reiterate, if it's a permanently installed pool, everything I'm getting ready to teach you tonight applies along with all of the other permanently installed pool codes. So it's so important that we understand how to classify these pools. When in doubt, call your electrical inspector. Let's look at some of the comments. We got Damien. He said, blessings. Appreciate you. He's here from Jamaica at 9.05 p.m. Cool, so we are multinational. I love it. We got TK in Florida. We got Lewis in MA. It's 10.05 p.m. Good, it's 10 o'clock here. Let me know if you guys are enjoying these 10 o'clock videos or if you prefer them in the morning. We're only going to be doing this live stuff for a little bit longer, so let's enjoy it while we've got it. Let's go ahead and move on. Now let's talk about equipotential bonding. What is it and why do we do it? Let's imagine that this is our pool, and we have our pool water. We have metal pool siding. We have a pump. We have a heater. We have a ladder. We have a metal ladder. Or excuse me, we have a heater, and we have a metal ladder. And we're going to say that we have some metal fencing. What equipotential bonding is, is the idea that we want to bring a certain section of the pool area all to the same electrical potential. How you bring something to the same electrical potential potential is you bond it together. You bond it together. Where the danger lies in electrical is when there is a difference of potential. I have 120 volts here, and I have this metal railing stubbed into the ground that's at zero volts. The potential difference between these two points is 120 volts. If you get in between this voltage source and this zero potential, you will now become the light bulb. The idea behind equipotential bonding is we're going to make this entire plane at the same potential. So if there's zero volts on it, there's zero volts everywhere. If there's four volts on it, there's four volts everywhere. Because the danger is not in the voltage, it's in the difference in potential. And I'll give a good example. Have you ever seen a bird setting up on a primary probably 13,600 volts, and you're wondering, how is this bird not being you know, electrocuted, shocked immediately, burst into flames? It's because that bird and that line are at the same electrical potential. However, have you ever seen the dead bird on the road? That bird somehow got in between that high voltage and another electrical potential. It doesn't even have to be zero. It could just be a lower potential. So if you had a 13.6 and a 13.5 and you got in between the two, you would have a 100 volts difference and you would feel that. So what happens to the bird that does get shocked is they're setting on the pedestal, but they've also got the pole right next to them or they're setting on the high voltage line. They've got a pole right next to them. They flap their wing and they hit the insulator that's holding that primary up and it's stubbed into the pole, which is stubbed into the ground. And now that bird has 13,600 volts in between them. It's only dangerous when you get into a difference of potential. And you say, why does 4 volts matter? Well, what if it was 120 volts standing on the water? We want 120 volts standing on the pump, 120 volts standing on the heater, 120 volts standing on the ground around the pool, which we're going to talk about, the surface surrounding the pool. We want 120 volts everywhere. Now, we never want 120 volts on a pool. And yes, something should trip, but what if it doesn't? And if we get chance tonight, I'll talk about other areas that voltage can come from that has nothing to do with the pool and the pool circulating equipment, but I don't want to get off in the weeds on that. So the idea behind this is, is we're going to bring this entire area, including the wall, the pump, the heater, uh, the water, anything metal, maybe metal surfaces around the pool, we're going to bring them all to the same potential by, uh, by mechanically bonding them together. And we're going to learn the methods to do that. The reason why it's so important is because they say that 30 volts and above is considered deadly when you're dry. Anything above 30 volts is considered deadly. When you are wet, 4 volts can kill you. 4 volts is considered deadly when you are wet. And it can be even worse depending on the scenario. 
So we want that entire area, if there is current leaking or if it's picking up some type of stray voltage from somewhere else, if you are, if you do have full four volts on your body, we want full vo four volts on the water. We want four volts on the railing. We want four volts on everywhere that you could potentially be completely immersed. Within five foot out and 12 foot high, we're going to talk about that as we continue on through. Now let's go ahead and break down, start breaking down the scenario. Let's talk about now what must be bonded. We got, uh, you're going to have to pronounce it, Haven. Hopefully I said that correctly. In Middle Tennessee, what's up? Shouting from East Tennessee over here. All right, if you guys have any questions, drop them down in the comments. If you're enjoying this master class, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And I do appreciate it. Now we're going to talk about what must be bonded. First, let's talk about circulation systems. And everything that we're covering here is laid out very clearly in 680.26. Pumps, heaters, treatments, pool shells, covers, salt things, anything that has to do with the circulation system of the pool must be bonded. Most of them are going to have a factory lug built right on, and there are going to be different ways that we can bond them. As long as we use one of the methods, we're going to be okay. Now let's talk about all metal, a -double -L metal, within five foot out from the pool's edge and 12 foot high. And in my opinion, that is from the, the highest point that, that is anywhere around that pool. It would be from the rim of the pool. It would be from the highest standing platform deck. Anywhere from the highest point around that pool is going to have to be bonded 12 foot above that. So if you had a metal pipe coming across or a piece of conduit coming across the building, you're going to have to bond that. Now, there are some new exceptions in the 2023. We're not going to get in them into them today. But let's just, for all sake of this lesson, everything metal within five feet and everything 12 foot high, so 5 foot out and 12 foot, which includes things like ladders, railings, posts, fencing, fixtures, lighting, gutters, door frames, like physical door frames, and I have pictures here in just a little bit, metal fittings, conduit, all different types of things. So any metal within 5 foot of that pool absolutely has to be bonded. And the reason is, is metal is most likely going to be at a difference of potential. If it's shoved into the ground, it's going to be at a difference of potential, like a fence post. If it is connected to an electrical system, it should be connected to an equipment grounding conductor, which is going to be at a zero, should be at zero volts. So if you had four volts on the water, you go to reach out and grab some metal, like the ladder or anything else. If it's not bonded, it's going to, the water's going to be at four. The ladder's going to be at zero. And you're going to be the light bulb. And, and there are a lot of people who die every year. All right. Now let's talk about the pool water. One that we that I'm thankful that they ultimately thought about is the pool water itself. What good does it do us if we have this giant equipotential bonding grid and we don't bond the water? What if the voltage is in the water? So we're in the water at four volts. We go to lean to give our wife a smooch on the side of that rail because she's outside the pool or we're outside the pool and we start putting pool kims in and we stick our hand in to, to rinse off the stick or do whatever and the water's at four volts, the railing's at zero and we have that difference of potential. So we want everything to be at the same potential. Now let's talk about surrounding surfaces. This is actually the aggregate that you're standing on. Let's go back to adding pool chemicals. Let's say you're adding pool chemicals, you're barefoot. Let's say that there's four volts standing on the rail. There's an LED light leaking. It's not tripping the GFCI. We don't know why. Maybe it's failing. Maybe they forgot to put it on there. You've got four volts on a low voltage LED light. It's leaking. The entire shell's hot and the water's hot. You're standing there barefoot outside putting pool kims in. The moment you touch that and your feet are at zero, you're going to have that difference in potential and voltage. You might not be wet. You might. What if it's 120 volts? So these are just things that we have to watch out for. This is going to include the concrete, the earth, and everything around it. We want to, and we're going to break down the specs for that. Now we're just talking about what must be bonded. We're going to show you how to bond the dirt around the pool, the concrete around the pool, and any other type of aggregate that we have. Slides, absolutely. If it has any type of metal on the slide, and the easiest way to remember, that's a great question, Lawrence. Absolutely, all slides, gutters, hand railings, 
anything diving boards. If it's metal at all, it's going to be bonded with very few exceptions, and we'll cover those exceptions here in just a little bit. All right. Now let's talk about how to bond it. So we're going to walk through a bonding, and we're going to cover the pumps, heaters, shells, and treatments. So when we're talking about bonding the pumps, this is what we're talking about here. Let me get my little... Let me get my little pointer out here. Not a highlighter. I want a laser pointer. Hopefully you guys can see it here. So when we take a look at this pool, pool pump here, we are going to have this little lug right here. And this lug is actually our grounding lug. That's where we're going to run our number eight bonding conductor that we're getting ready to learn about. We're going to run it through that lug. Now it can finish and terminate at that lug or it can just loop right through that lug. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. This is what it's going to look like on a pool. Some pools are what's called double insulated and the, the pump itself does not need bonded. You still have to provide provisions for bonding for later. So if you're doing a brand new pool and it does not have the ground lug and it's not supposed to be grounded or bonded, you still have to leave a bonding whip because when they come and change that pool pump out in two years, the new ones don't last I mean, no amount of time. They don't last no amount of time compared to the old ones. So that might last you, what, you know, six to 15 years. Now, that every couple of years, they're replacing these pumps. So that pool guy is going to come, and if there's not a whip there for him to hook up to, he's not going to hook anything up. So you actually have to, even if you're not required to bond your pump, you are required to leave it there. And they are still bonded through the equipment grounding conductor on the inside. And this is the pool bond. Oh, I had a nice circle. That's nice. This is the pool bonding lug here. They've just added that on at the factory. And just one thing you want to watch out for here, make sure that factory screw is tight. I have found them loose before, especially when you start jostling on it. And after the plumbers are done doing all their magic, you could say, you need to come back and make sure everything's tight. I've found these loose I've found these loose, and I've found the water bond loose just from them jostling and doing their plumbing around the stuff. So just make sure you come back and double check that. Now let's talk about the second one, which is all metal within. Oh, here's here's a, a picture of a heater. Down right here, bottom middle, this is how you would bond the heater, and you would bond the heater right there. Boom, right there. I've even got a larger arrow. Love it. Now let's talk about the frame of the pool itself. We're going to cover how to do that here in just a little bit, but you're also going to bond the metal frame. Some people say, well, it only has metal you know, pieces in between. You're going to bond those. I don't want to get too far ahead of the game. We're going to cover that here in just a little bit. Now let's talk about the ladders, railings. This includes things like ladders, all pool ladders, a lot of them will have a lug already built in. If it does not, you are going to be adding one. You'll just add a lug and you'll use a tap tool. And you could add a lug like this. Most of them will already have a lug built in, that, so you don't have to worry about that. Something like this, any type of uh, coping or any type of setup for the rails for the ladder or for a slide, this could be, this could be for a slide, you're going to bond those. They'll often have the lug right there on, on there for you to bond it. If they don't, you just put one on it. This includes things like railings, fencing. I love the that, that gate right there. All of that would have to be bonded if it's within five foot. This is a big one that people forget about a lot, and it's gas fixtures. And gas fixtures absolutely have to be bonded. A lot of them now are in the water. Could you think about, it's got a circuit off and running to it for an igniter, or even just the low, uh, just the battery igniter that is on it. You absolutely could get shocked and killed off uh, something like this if you're at a difference of potential. I'm not saying necessarily that the battery could shock and kill you, but if you've got an, uh, you know 120 volt igniter to it, you definitely want to make sure that you're bonding all gas, all gas surrounding fixtures and everything else to do with it that are integral to the pool, in the pool, or within five feet. This also includes waterfalls and things like that. This, uh, this cover right here, you're going to have to bond it. It's likely going to have lugs built into it. Anything else within the five feet of that pool has to be bonded. Things like gutters, something you don't think about very often is you don't think about gutters, and they are very dangerous. And let me explain to you why. For one, we know that this is highly likely to be at a difference of potential uh, connected to the earth. 
uh, one way or another, where it's whether it's screwed in through the fascia, whether it's uh, you know connected up through the fascia, through the metal roof, through a metal drain pipe uh, or metal vent pipe in the plumbing that's bonded. There's many ways that this could be bonded in direct connection to the earth, buried in the earth. And the main reason that you want to make sure that gutters are bonded is because if you're using a metal skimmer in the back of that skimmer, you know, you're in the water, you're doing your business, you know, you got that thing extended or you're standing outside the pool. If that gutter is within five feet or 12 foot high and you tap that gutter and that it, it you know, sometimes the gutters at a difference of potential. I had some roofers get shocked on a roof. I'll tell you a really good story. I had a customer that got shocked off the gutter at his house. I went up there and I searched for two hours, it felt like, and I was getting ready to give up. I was going in to tell this little old customer, they were 70 and 75 probably, and I was getting ready to tell them that I got to come back because I can't find the problem. We had 120 volts standing on the whole gutter system on the roof and all, and when I go into their living room, I look at the metal stove, and sure enough, the blower to their metal wood stove had faulted out. It wasn't tripping the breaker, but it was energizing the pot stove, which energized the pipe going up, which energized the metal roof, which put 120 volts onto the gutter, which shocked the customer. The moment I unpl I set my tick tester, my pen tester, and I set it on the pot stove, and the moment I unplugged it, it quit beeping. It was the most amazing story. So they had 120 volts. So you might have the voltage on the gutter from your guy who just came and installed gutters. You tap that with the skimmer, you're now at a difference of potential in the water because your pool's all bonded correctly. So there's so many reasons that, that we are doing this and the, the heightened danger, because these dangers are out there everywhere. The heightened danger is that we're wet, we have kids in the water, and you could uh, not only die from the shocking, but from electric shock drowning. Let's look at some of the, let's look at some of the comments here. JC said, what up? What's up, coach? What's up, JC? Pools are a pain. I really like pools. They can be a pain. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's just, I'm kind of a simple dude. You could call me maybe even, maybe even just a simple dumb redneck. And I don't understand a whole lot. But I know how to wire your whole pool and make it safe. I think that's why I like uh, ambient temperature corrections and bundling adjustments if you've ever taken any of my exam prep. I think I like that for the simple reason that the fact that I even know how to do it and then not only that, know how to go teach somebody else how to do it, that's a major accomplishment for me. I checked out of school mentally in about seventh grade, okay, got into drugs and alcohol. For me to be able to do this lesson here tonight and to teach it to you and to be able to go out and wire it, it's a miracle. So I think for a dumb redneck, I think it's pretty cool that I that I know how to do this. And somebody who checked out of school very early. Now, I went back after I quit school, got my GED, got some college. I've been very fortunate in the electrical industry. But just to even understand this stuff is a huge accomplishment to me. Now, I don't understand a lot of things, but I can go out and wire your pool. And I'm going to go to bed at night not worrying about you. So that's just, just you know, just I guess that's why I like it so much. Because it is a huge accomplishment for me. And let's talk about this one here. You see this window frame? I don't have a tape measure on me, but that looks like it's within five foot of the edge of that pool. What do you want to guarantee that this metal frame right here is at zero volts? I bet it is. What do you think? Could that ever become energized? Somebody laying an extension cord doing some Christmas lights outside? Got a nick in the cord or they're using an in indoor rated cord. I know you've never seen that where people use an indoor rated cord for Christmas lights. But just imagine with me for just a second. I love that. You go out there and they got them old brown extension cords with no ground on it running all the Christmas lights. But let's say they've got some Christmas lights out here and they've laid that cord against it. It's got a nick in it. 120 volts standing on this frame. Everything's fine and dandy till we're sitting in the pool and we reach back to put our iPhone over there and sure enough, we get lit up. I'm an Android man, but you may be an iPhone man, so I figured I'd say that for you. Let's talk about metal fittings. Metal fittings must be bonded unless, I love it, it's the national exception code, unless they are four, less than four inches, four inches, Metal fittings must be bonded unless they are less than four inches in any dimension and do not penetrate the pool structure more than one inch. 
Let me give you a really good example of this. I don't know if I have a photo or not. A really good example of something that does not need to be bonded is every single conduit strap for your piece of liquid type. Thankfully, every one of those do not have to be bonded. But where this really helps out is things like ball valves. Let's say you put a ball valve near the pool so you can backwash or whatever. And let's say it has a metal handle on it. Well, man, wouldn't it be a pain? And the whole apparatus is plastic except for the metal handle. Wouldn't it be a pain to have to come up and bond that metal ball valve? It's saying, hey, if it's not, if it's less than four inches in any dimension, you don't have to do it. But no matter, regardless of the size, if it penetrates the pool structure more than one inch, excuse me, meaning into the pool structure, it is required to be bonded. So just keep that in mind. Let's take a look at this one here. This is a really practical one. This looks like rigid metal conduit to me. Looks like they've utilized the six inch rule so they didn't have to dig very deep. They dealt with some roots right here, didn't they? They come up, they've stubbed up here. This looks nice, nice, and, clean. nice neat, and clean. They've got their receptacle within 20 foot of the pool. I feel good about that. Here's the kicker. They come over here. When this conduit gets within five foot of that right there, you better believe it has to be bonded. You're just going to run down here. You're going to put a, a pipe clamp that's rated for direct burial, and you're going to make it part of your equip, uh, your equipotential bonding grid. All right, now let's talk about the pool water itself. I love this one. So what the code states is that we must have nine square inches in contact with the water. In order to, let's head over to 6, uh, 680.26 here, and we'll look at the code. It says that we must have 9 square inches in contact with the water at all times. So if you're backwashing or working on the pool in any manner, that fitting has to be arranged so it will be in contact with the water at all times. That's going to be laid out here in 680.26. The first thing right here, if this ladder is in contact with the water you're good to go. You're good to go if the ladder's in contact with the water. I'm looking for it in the code here. Metal fittings, equipment, fixed metal parts, speakers, wiring methods, pool water. Where none of the bonded parts are in direct contact with the pool water, pool water, it shall be in a, 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 an approved corrosion-resistant conductive surface and this has not less than nine square inches in contact with the water. What it's saying, if you don't have something like in the top two pictures, like the first picture is going to be a ladder, as long as it's in contact with the water, you're good to go. The water's bonded. As long as you've properly bonded the railing, right? Whether it's this railing right here just to get down in, or if it's the pool ladder. As long as you properly bonded the pool ladder, voila, the water's automatically bonded. Now, if it's a removable ladder, you must bond it, but you cannot use that as the bonding. Must be in contact with the water at all times. What this code's saying here is that if you are not in contact with the water at all times, you are allowed to, or excuse me, if you do not have a ladder or a railing or another piece of bonded metal that's in contact with the water at all times, then you're allowed to use what's called a bonding fitting. Now they make this version here, which is an inline bond fitting. All of these must be, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it goes into that it has to be listed or labeled or identified here in 680, but I would make sure that it's listed, labeled, and identified for the use, that it's corrosion resistant. I'm not installing a water bond fitting unless it's listed, labeled, and identified for what I'm using it for. I don't know if the code draws that out. Not all equipment has to be listed, labeled, or identified, uh, or any, or doesn't have to be all three of them. But this is one of those things that I'm going to make sure it is. So you'll take this inline uh, fitting. I think it's usually an inch and a half by a one inch or inch and a quarter by one inch, and they probably make a two inch by one inch. But if I'm not mistaken, this stub piece right here is a one inch. And this fitting actually just threads right into it. You put your Teflon tape on there, you'll put your pop dope on there, and you'll thread that fitting down in there. And this bell piece will actually stick down in the water. That's what's going to give us our nine square inches. And then this up here is just a split bolt really attached to it. And you're going to run your number eight to it. It's very simple. Another type that they sell is like this. And I've grown to absolutely love these. And the reason is, is because the pool guys don't have a clue, a lot of them, and they will not bond the pool. 
no matter what you say. And this is something that you can add later. This one goes into the skimmer. You'll buy the whole kit. And if you buy the right one, it comes with the little drill bit and everything. It's just this little awesome kit that you'll install. And you'll walk up to the skimmer, pull the basket out. You want it down real low, but you got to make sure that you get an edge that works with it. You don't want like an octagon edge. You want a flat edge. And you have to make sure that it's always going to be in contact with the water. But you pull that out. You're going to uh, pull your skimmer out. You're going to get down in there, and you're going to set this piece from the inside. This piece will go on the inside, and then this piece will go on the outside, and they will smoosh together. That's a new word. It's an Article 100. Check it out. It's called smoosh. We're going to smoosh these together, and you'll actually tighten that thing on there. It's very good. I've not had one leak yet. I've had zero troubles, and then it's going to come with this lug right here on it, and that's how you're going to bond your water that way. I've grown very fond of these. I prefer there to be a metal ladder or a metal rail. If you can't get that, I would love to see an inline water fitting. If it's too late, add one of these that go in the skimmer or some other listed, labeled, and identified method. That's my opinion on that. You can work with your electrical inspector. Let's see what Lewis here said. He said, I remember one time when I was looking to run a bathroom vent duct work, and when I stuck my head above the suspended ceiling, my hair rose up immediately, and I felt a tingling sensation. Oh, my goodness, that would be terrifying. That's hilarious. And on that note, I'm going to give you guys a little tip. Anytime I go into a drop ceiling, I've got my ticker in my hand. You might not like pen testers, but I assure you, they will save your life way more than they'll harm your life. Just don't trust it with your life. Is that a good way to think about it? Anytime I go up to a drop ceiling, first thing I'm checking is the grid. Is that grid hot? Then I go up there and I'm checking the duct work, the metal pipe, and everything around. I'm up around my neck, around my hands, resting my arms, wiring something up. I want to know everything around me is not energized because you could blink. And my man here, he said his, he had his hair lined up. Um, does it matter where the inline fitting is located? Yes, it does, Lawrence. I'm glad that you asked that question. As long as that inline fitting is always going to be in contact with the water, then you're okay. Meaning... That if you are shutting stuff off and draining the pool or you are backwashing or doing any other type of work with the pool, that at that moment, that pipe is not dry. Talk with your pool guy about if it needs to be in front of it. Seems like it needs to be on the downside of the skimmer because it will always be in contact with the water. The backside might not always be in contact with the water, but you need to work with your pool guy say hey where can i put this that the pipe will never be dry you want it always in contact with the water because if somebody's out here back washing or working on the pool while the kids are in the pool and the moment they get rid of that water bond you know it shows where the leak was or there was a leak on the railing and the moment they change the potential they could potentially be shocked so just keep that in mind there here's how this looks beautiful graphic here it's going to go on it's going to come in this is showing it coming in from the outside. You're actually going to take this, this piece on the inside, go through the outside. You're going to come onto this stud and screw on your thing, and it's going to lock it right up. The metal piece actually goes on the inside. All right, looks good. Now let's talk about the concrete or earth. First, let's talk about how to do a above-ground pool or any pool that is not going to be receiving concrete. This is how you deal with it. And let's say this is how you deal with above ground pools that are not going to be receiving concrete because you could, depending on how, this is a real part of the code where you really have to look at it, interpret it. But let's deal with above ground pools and then you could use this method in lieu of other methods that are in the code book. And when you read it for yourself, you'll see that's how it is. Let's say that we're bonding an above ground pool. Now it can be completely above ground, but capable of holding larger than 42 inches of water, or it could be partially in ground regardless of the depth. What we're going to do to bond the surface around the pool, this is what the code book says, work with your local electrical inspector on all of this. And don't repeat anything in these videos, just use them for educational purposes only. What you're going to do is you're going to physically dig a trench four to six inches deep below the subgrade. You have to work out with your inspector what you consider subgrade. And then 18 to 24 inches away from the pool is your zone that you have to be in. And then you're going to tap that pool shell 
at at least four points. I have a, it, actually the next slide is a very step-by-step -step instructional of how to do this. All right, let's go ahead and bond our first above ground pool. The red circle is the five feet mark. So if you notice, everything within five feet has to be bonded. Everything to do with the circulation system, regardless of how far away it is. Metal railing, metal ladders, and the pool water. And in this case, it looks like that fence falls within that five feet, doesn't it? Let's take it one step at a time. So we're going to start somewhere. Let's say we start at the heater. And you're going to physically dig a trench in the ground, four to six inches deep, below subgrade, from the heater to the pump. You're going to start at the pump on the lug, or on the heater on the lug, dig a little trench over to the pump, and go ahead and bond that pump lug while you're there. Then you're going to go from the pump over to the railing, and this is where you start your in-ground bonding. So you're going to dig a trench four to six inches deep over to the frame of the pool, and you're going to bond the pool there. We're going to learn how to physically bond it here in just a little bit. Now I'm showing you, I want you to understand intellectually how we do it and what we're doing. Starting there, we're going to start what I call our spider web. We're going to go around the pool with a shovel and a positive attitude or a pick, and we're going to dig a little trench four to six inches deep, 18 to 24 inches away from the pool. What we want to do is create a zone. We're creating a zone so matter, no matter where you're standing, you're inside that same potential. So down in the dirt, you're going to dig 18 to 24 inches. While you're right here, let's jump over and let's tap the fence. Jump over, we're going to tap this metal fence. Now you can do one continuous run all the way around the pool, but you're not required to. You can, is it better? Of course it is, but you're not required to. What if they put the fence later? You just use a split bolt or some other approved method that's rated for direct burial and rated for concrete encasement if you're doing it. I think usually if they're rated for DB, they're already rate, uh, rated for concrete encasement or vice versa. So we're going to pop off this frame here with a whole piece that is just a loop. And what you do is you just come to it and bend it. You come over and tap the pool, do your lug, and you send that chute out to the fence. Do another loop, bend it, and bend it back over to the pool to continue your spider web. Now we're going to spider web back out 18 to 24 inches. And we're going to go and do we're going to do it again. We're going to come into the pool, bend a loop, stick it to the pool, hook it to the lug. We're going to do that and then we're going to spider back out 18 to 24 inches out, 4 to 6 inches deep below the subgrade. Then when we get to the ladder, we're going to go ahead and bond the ladder and we're going to also be bonding the frame of the pool at this point. Bond the ladder while we're there and then make sure you complete the circle. We are creating a zone. That's our equipotential plane. It's super important that we understand this intellectually. And now we would technically be done with this pool as long as there was no other you know, things that we needed to bond. I'm going to show you something that you don't have to do and that you need to get approved by your inspector, but I want to plant a seed. I go ahead and I run all the way around the heater and all, I don't know if I have another slide, so I'm not going to push it yet or another motion. But I will dig a ditch all the way around the heater and all the way around the pump. Let me ask you a question. Are you any less at danger of touching something that's at a difference of potential while working with this pool while you are over backwashing the pump or while you're over fiddling with the heater? I think you're at just as much or more of a potential danger over there than you are around the pool. So I go ahead and run a ring around the heater and a ring around the pump. Let me see if I had one more slide. I sure did. I didn't want to jump to the next slide. I go ahead and do that. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not even saying it's okay to do it. But think about it and talk to your inspector about it. What's it cost me? Another $4 worth of copper? Run that ring around there. And then no matter where they're at, if they're on their hands and knees looking down, trying to figure out why the switch to the pump isn't working, they're completely grounded out, probably soaking wet in their ball shorts. And they are grounded, the definition of grounded. So I like to go ahead and run around. You can consider it. I just want to plant a little bit of a seed there. Let's take a look at some of the comments. We got Jacob. What's going on, bro? Glad to see 680.26B got away from the copper ring. Maybe in the 2023, but not in the 2020. When you say the copper ring, you'll have to let me know what you mean. Because we are building a copper ring right now, so I'll have to see what, you, what you're talking about there. How to bond the full pool frame and has it got a spot to land it? 
Uh, Ronbo, I appreciate you asking. I'm going to show you here in just a little bit how to bond the frame. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use a tap tool and we're going to tap it and then add a lug, but I cover it in detail in here in just a little bit. Now let's talk about underground pools. Now this is very situational. I'm going to cover just some basics. Uh, actually, I'm going to cover the majority of the scenarios that you're going to cover, but there are some nuances that could catch you or add something to you. Now, this is when we're dealing with underground pools. All of the same rules apply for the 5 foot out and the 12 foot high. We're going to pretend that this metal, you know, this metal bar right here, uh, or this red line is our 5 foot out. Let's go ahead and take a look at it here. Let's say the rebar extends three foot or more and it is non-encapsulated. So this little checker pattern is my rebar. We're going to say that it extends three foot or more. If it doesn't, there's this large prescription to how to make it extend three foot. Make your pool contractor make it a three foot sidewalk. If it's a two foot sidewalk, you're going to have to build a copper grid one by one, if I'm not mistaken, copper grid all the way around that pool. So make sure that the rebar extends at least three foot. If it is of the non-encapsulated type, there are some you know type of rebar that you have to use. It's almost always big enough every time you're dealing with a pool. But if that's there, we're definitely going to bond it. We're going to imagine for scenario one that this is a completely gunite pool, meaning it's all metal. Everything's metal. This is metal, or it's all rebar. This is rebar down in the water's rebar. Everything is rebar about, around this pool. I'm going to talk to you about two different ways your inspector might interpret this. You guys can drop down in the comments below how yours does. We're going to start over at the heater. We still have to bond the heater and the pump. All the normal rules apply. There are some inspectors, if this is all metal, would only require you to dig over here and bond that rebar right there. Then you would do a jumper from the rebar to the diving board, and then you, some, some of them might only make you do a jumper from the rebar to the fence and call this done, because technically all of it is bonded. There are some inspectors that would let you do that. You guys can drop down in the uh, comments what your, how your inspector feels, or even better, if you're an inspector, let us know how you interpret it. A lot of inspectors, including myself, and there's nothing wrong with either way, I say do it more. Do it you know, above and beyond. I would want you to do the heater, the pump, hit that right there, but I would still want you to hit it at four different places and make a complete circle. Call it overkill, call it whatever you want, I'm fine with it. And then I would want a jumper. Technically, you could take a jumper from the rebar, do a clamp, and go straight to here without it actually extending to that ring, in my opinion. But you do what your inspector says. And you could do a jumper from the rebar to here, and it'd be legal, and you just do a jumper from the rebar as long as the rebar is properly bonded. But there's the best way to do it is to do from the heater to the pump to here, and then do four points, do a physical connection to the copper grid, the copper ground wire, to here, and then a physical connection from the copper grid to here, and then continue to go all the way around the pool. You guys can let me know how your inspector, uh, it gets late. One thing about doing these late is it starts to get late. How your inspector uh, interprets that code. One thing I've noticed just the last two nights, of course we've been grinding, but uh, I'm noticing these late sessions, I start to get a little bit slower in the thought, which might be better because I might be talking slower than normal, but probably not. All right, let's go ahead and look. And let's say that the rebar extends more than three foot and is encapsulated. You're not going to be bonding the encapsulated rebar. Make sure you work with your inspector. Then you would definitely have to have that extend all the way around and do your normal four-point bonding. So just work with your inspector. Very nuanced here and very situational depending on your situation. And you would have to build... Oh, yeah. You, let me... Let me hatch this out, this part of the code. Some people might interpret it, and the code may just straight up read it, that you have to build a grid all the way around it. But I'm going to look in the code before I talk to you guys about that. It's been a little while since I've taught this lesson. One thing about the code, and I might teach an hour lesson. If I've taught an hour lesson, there's probably 30 codes and a bunch of different ways to interpret it. So sometimes I have to stop and say, let me come back to you on this piece. I can tell you this, that I've recorded this whole session in not live mode, and it's called Pool Bonding 101. 
So just go watch my video. I'll have to go back. I usually don't go back and watch my own video. I go back to the code and just read the code. And I've gotten to that point in my career. But if I ever really forget something that I've taught, one thing about being in three different code cycles and, and absorbing so much code is you'll put one code in and two codes will fall out. But go back and watch my, my non-live version of this video. It's called Pool Bonding 101. And I explain uh, very slowly what this code covers here. Not going to touch it during this live session. Now let's talk about if the rebar extends only two foot and is not encapsulated. In my opinion, the code reads that you would have to extend that grid with a copper grid. So make sure, make sure, make sure that the rebar extends at least three feet out because you're having to build basically a three foot bonded sidewalk all the way around. And it has to be bonded so when they pour the concrete, it's bonded. So make sure that you work with the code and with your inspector. Now let's talk about the methods of bonding. Let's look at some of the questions here. Some of the questions, glad to see how to bond. We're gonna talk about that. Cool, thanks. I would like it to be one continuous run of copper. I prefer less splices. I agree with you 100%. Not always possible, but it is preferred. JC, appreciate you, bro. Appreciate all your support. Let's talk about the methods of bonding. If you guys are enjoying this, give this a thumbs up. They're on YouTube. If you want to put a thumbs up in the live chat, I would appreciate that. Methods of bonding. Let's talk about all the different methods. This is one of the most popular methods, and this goes back to your question uh, Ron Bo, about how you tap the side of that that pool structure. You're going to want to go to a thick part because you have to have at least three threads engaged. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to go back to 250.8. Let's go back to 250.8 real quick. And I believe it's three threads engaged. It may be two threads engaged, and I just want to double check. One thing about it, you don't have to memorize everything in the code. You just need to remember where it's at. And this one's going to be listed in 250.8. You guys got a minute, don't you? Let's go to 250.8. When we get over to 250.8, these are connections of grounding and bonding equipment. And we go to a thread forming machine screw that's engaged not less than two threads. Okay, so it's not three. I feel like there was a big misnomer for a long time that it was three threads. And sometimes when you get taught something, it sticks in there more than the actual code. Because I've recently done a grounding and bonding 210.8 like masterclass, and it covered this extensively. So it has to have at least two threads engaged. So when you go to install this, so how you'll do this, uh, Ronbo, is that how you say it? I like that, Ronbo. When you go to do this, what you're going to do is you're going to use a tap tool. Now, they have them now that go on your drill and tap and thread at the same time. So you're going to go and you're going to use a tap tool and you're going to use a 1032 tap tool. You're going to use stainless steel screws or some other non-corrosive uh, type that is listed here in 680. And what you're going to do is you're going to get yourself a washer, a 1032 uh, machine screw, and you are going to get a nut on the back side. And you are going to tap it and thread the foot. Typically, we do the foot. And the foot is then bonded to the other metal uh, part of the shell. I want the feet bonded. And as long as they're all screwed together and bolted with at least two threads, you don't have to bond every single foot. But if they're not connected together, you would have to bond every single foot. Just keep that in mind. If the way that the pool siding laps is not a satisfactory bond you might have to bond every single piece so just keep that in mind but if it falls back and it's connected in one of the methods listed in 250.8 I'm perfectly fine with it and I believe your inspector will be too but make sure you work with your inspector so what you're going to do is you're going to go to the foot of the rail that's holding it all together you're going to go down there you're going to dig out underneath it hopefully you might have access but if not just dig out underneath it you're going to use a 1032 tap tool you're going to use the the drill bit and then you're going to tap it and then you're going to thread that thing on with a washer and you are going to and some people use lock washers both um or or a lock washer whatever you deem appropriate i like to get as much surface area coverage as possible then you're going to screw that nut on the bottom you're going to tighten that thing down tight and if you look over here on this fitting there's a hole right there and that's going to slip through the machine screw it's going to go down through and it is going to 
uh, it is going to tighten all up very tightly. You want to make sure after you land your wire, then you land your wire right here. They've got it so you can loop it and roll, and you're going to screw that down with the flathead, torque it to the appropriate torque, and then after you're all done, go back and make sure that they're all tight. I'm not telling you to double torque. I'm just telling you to verify and make sure that you're satisfied with how tight everything is. One good way to deal with it is go through and rough it all in, and then go back with the torque, torque it one time, and be done with it. That's one way to do it. You also can, you can just drill a hole and use the 1032 machine screw to just nut it on. But I like to have the threads as well as kind of my double protection. You do not have to. So if you run into a thinner piece of metal that you're not going to get two threads engaged, you can just use a, uh, you know, a machine screw, a washer, and a nut on the back side and just tighten it really tight and make sure that that thing's clamped down tight. I prefer it to be threaded because you're going to get that double protection. That's just my opinion. Now let's go ahead and look at these here. This is how you're going to splice it. I know very split bolts almost seem like we're doing something wrong, but this is the proper way to splice this wire. If you do have to make a splice, you can have your loop and then grab it put a split bolt on it, stick the wire in there, tighten that thing down and branch off to anywhere else that you want to. You can do it like that. I do want to back up here. Let me think of how to back. I love it. Airplane riding backwards. I do want to talk about these fittings right here. This is a this is one here. This is a very common one. If you look here at this rebar, that's a good solid rebar grounding clamp. Make sure that it's listed for what you're doing or identified or whatever the code calls for or all three listed identified. Uh, for, for the purpose and the reason is is that these need to be rated for direct burial if they're going to be directly buried these also need to be rated as rebar clamps and they need to be rated for the the grounding the size wire that you're putting through because they sell different sizes of these so just make sure that you're using the right fittings i'm not going to beat this to death you guys know to do this all the time but this is a really cool one right here you pop this at your four points rock and roll and let's go back and talk about the four points here for a minute that's a code minimum you can do as many points as you want to do and often on a round pool i'll do five six seven eight points of course with your inspector's approval but i like to do the more the merrier so i'll go in and tap it at many points i go way above and beyond in my pool bonding because i want it to be very robust so we got our fittings here now let's talk about ways to attach the fittings here is one way to attach it. You could use a lug like that. Then we have something like this, a tap tool. You can just use drill bits and nuts and washers, but I prefer to you to tap and do the other. That way you've got the double protection. Also, this is what we're talking about here. So you can use this stainless brass. There are a bunch of different ones listed here in 680. I'm not exactly sure where in 680 it is listed. I think it is toward... The front when we're talking about bonding or it may actually be listed right here in 680.26 it talks about the different types of stuff that you are allowed to use to bond it 680 is a pretty big article i'm not just going to dig for it but it tells you i think it's stainless steel brass maybe some coated zincs i'm not sure i definitely want you to go read that for yourself it has to be rated for the area that you're in whether it's db concrete rated or you're in a corrosive environment and it lays out the ones that you're allowed to use for bonding we want it to be listen you're only going to be there one time on this nobody calls you out really for troubleshooting on a solidly bonded system so you want to make sure it's super tight you want to make sure everything is right and true because this is the most important part of this pool install and if it's not tight or it, the fittings rust out or you've bought the wrong things for the corrosive environment it's useless and if you've got an unbonded pool my friend you've got a dangerous pool now if you grew up in my day we had a an, an above ground pool on a hundred foot extension cord that was uh, ran through the crack of the door that was not on gfci protection and only by the grace of god am i alive here to teach this lesson here tonight let's go ahead and get to it what's going on michael what's going on bro appreciate you and JC says, I don't do many pools. Well, I hope you get into them, man. They are a lot of fun. I hope you get to do one. Uh, they're a lot of fun. It's a great challenge. It's great money. There's a lot of great money in pools. And one of the beautiful things about it is not a whole lot of people know how to do them. So if you if you learn it, and it's really just this, and if you ever need to call me, just call me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I promise you I know somebody that does. And uh, we'll help you get through it. They're a lot of fun. All right, guys, I want to thank you. Definitely don't do this. I love this picture. So these guys are sitting around. 
drinking something, grilling something. They've got the cord hooked up here. Is that an axe handle over here to the left, or, a, or actually the axe head? Looks like an axe head to me, or it might be just a wood block. Not sure. Got it taped, and they've got the cord running through the water into the flip-flops over here. Now, I pray that this was a joke, but that table looks pretty... I mean, they, this is not their first time doing it. These guys look pretty casual. So, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys enjoyed this live master class. You can tell that the coach, you don't see me very uh, very slow very often, but I, I'm going to work. It's not I could work. I'm going to work till 2 a.m. today. Uh, you know, be working on multiple things. Uh, so I'm just excited. And I hope that you guys enjoyed the lesson. This was an online live master class for pool bonding at least all the basics the fundamentals hopefully you've got a good place to start with if you ever have any questions you can always just text me at 423-895-3247 i am just going to take just a couple minutes i want to if you guys have any questions i want you to be able to ask those and i definitely want to give a plug for my lifetime membership on my website if you've not been to electricalexamcoach.com you need to go check it out we have the number one electrical exam prep program out there. Uh, we have the number one free version out there. You can check it out totally for free. I'm going to put some links in this video chat here so you guys can see it. I'm going to go to electrical. I'm actually going to make it so you guys can see it too. We'll make it so y'all can see it too. Let's just go ahead and go together. Load up and go with us. That's what I say. Load up and go with us. So we're going to make it so you guys can load up and go with us. We'll give you a little tour of the website while we're answering the questions. Go to electricalexamcoach.com, and we are going to check out the website. So when you get to the website, you can sign up right here. You can log in right here. Let's show you guys the free version first. So when we go to the free version, it's going to send you back to my electricalcodecoach.com. I have it all on one page. You can do the complete free version videos right here. Lesson two, lesson three takes you through grounding and bonding, box fill, uh, motors, everything that you need to know in order to pass your NEC exam or all the fundamentals. Then if you want to go right here, you can buy our pro version. Right now, it's only $19.99 a month. $49.99 for the year or $99 for lifetime for anything we ever build on that platform for life. Now let's go back and take a look at the website itself. When you get here, it's going to be laid out. You're going to want to do all of the pro version. And if you, what you'll do is you'll click on lesson one, start here. And if you're logged in, you can go through the quizzes. When you go through the quiz, you have to be logged in. When you go through the quizzes, give me just a second and I'll get logged in and I will let you guys see what it looks like to do the quizzes. Give me just a second. I'll get logged in and we will go do a quiz. You'll go to the pro version and let's go back here and give you guys access to see. Hello, here we are. And we're here at the pro version. So we're going to go down. We're going to go to, we'll say lesson two. And let me show you how awesome this is. So when you go down through here, you watch the video and then you're going to click on the lesson two quiz. When you get to the lesson two quiz, it's going to start right away. What's the resistance on 120 volt circuit? It's whatever we was relevant to what we're learning about or just some questions that I got you on there to challenge you. Let's say we click 10 ohms. Oh, I got it incorrect. So right, you're going to find out right then if you got the answer right. Below it, we're going to give you written feedback. And what we're working on now is we're working on giving you video explanations for every single question that's in the testing center that needs an explanation. Meaning that, yes, you've got your written feedback here, but if you click this button right here, it will take you to a video explaining step by step how I got the answer. I give you a minute to pause it before I explain it so you can try to work it out on your own. Then I tell you the answer. Then I break down step by step how we got the answer. Nobody's done this. It's unprecedented. It's going to be a game changer. So if you've got a very complicated question, yes, I've got the written feedback, which is good, but I'm a real visual learner and I want to learn as fast as possible. So you can click on that button right there and you can find out how to do this complex question, the exact one that you're looking at or one that is very similar. It's one thing that we offer that nobody else offers. We can do the ECC testing center right here. And you can go through. It's now 2017 and 2020 and previous compatible. Soon it will be 2023 compatible in the next 12 months. These are topical tests. You can do, go do ampacity, ranges, motors, transformers, box fill, pipe fill. Let's click on pipe fill. 
you might have some, uh, these are really cool. I've started doing these. These are interactive uh, things explaining the tables. So you can come through here in this column. It's going to tell you how to use the, the tables for pipe fill. Here's another one of actual the actual NXC. It explains piece by piece, which I also explain in my video, but it's great refresher. And then you can go here and do a just a master it pipe fill quiz and every question's about pipe fill. Then when you want to go back, you'll go back to the ECC testing center. We've got some practice, 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 practice exams. And then we've got these 40 question exams, super excited. Then another thing that we have that nobody else has is we have these videos. They are 10 questions, hey one after another after another. I ask you the question, you pause the video, I give you time to answer it, and then I give you a full video explanation of how to find the answer. So these, these are just some of the things that nobody offers but us. If you go right now to electrical code, hopefully you guys aren't getting a feedback loop. Electrical code, I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, it's awful quiet, but you might be getting a feedback loop. All right, if you go to electricalcodecoach.com first, I've got it on sale. So you click here. If you want a lifetime membership, you click right here. Boom, it's on sale for $99. And then I create you a profile for electricalexamcoach.com. You can also purchase it right here. I'm going to log out and show you how to do it. Let's go back to electricalexamcoach.com. You can purchase it right here. Click on pro version. And then you can click on sign up or you can click on sign up right here. And I will put both of these links in this chat here in just a second. You go down here and you can select your level. If you want to go monthly for $19.99, smoke and deal. If you want to go to $49.99 for a year, auto renewal. Or if you just want to pay a one-time fee, it's only $99, y'all. These seminars are $1,500 and you got to pay for your hotel and all this mess. They shove it all down your throat in three weeks. You'll have an unlimited set of videos that you can watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week for life. And you've got to coach. Call me, 423-895-3247. Leave a voicemail. I'll get back to you when I can, and I'll help you side-by-side side all the way to the front door of the testing center if I need to. So just check that out. Let me share this link with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and take it off of the share screen just in case I jump onto some stuff that doesn't need to be seen in the background. I'm going to go ahead and drop it down in the chat. Then we're going to take a few minutes to answer some questions, and we'll jump off for tonight. Let's go ahead and share this one with y'all. Boom. If you want to sign up that way, or if you want to get the $99 sale for the lifetime membership, if anybody signs up now or within the next hour, I will let you do. So by midnight 07 Eastern Standard Time, if you'll sign up, I'll let you do a buy one, give one lifetime membership. And what I mean by that is, is you'll do a buy one, give one membership. Hopefully I'm still on. It's so funny. It showed me getting up and leaving the chair on my video screen here. Oh, it's showing the replay from earlier. That's hilarious. I was like, it showed me getting up on my, on, out of my chair on the video, but that's from earlier when I got up. That was, that was wild. Long story short, check it out. If you sign up for the lifetime membership right now, I'll give you a buy one, give one. Meaning that if you buy one, you can give one to somebody else. Love it. And if you do it within the next hour, just email me. Or if anybody that signs up for the next hour, I'll just pursue you and get you to do it. But let's go ahead and take a look at it. And then I've given you both of those links. Go ahead and get started. Now let's go back. Oh, appreciate you, Ronbo. Thank you. Shout out. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Maro, hope I pronounced that correctly. Really appreciate you for sharing your knowledge. Love it. Appreciate you, brother. Just happy to be a part of your journey. And 680.26Bs for material use. I'll look at that, Miles. Thanks for calling it out. What code cycle are you in? Just so I can be thorough. I've got them here. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm in the same code cycle. Uh, Jesus said, Coach, I failed my electrical journeyman three times. Then I came across your videos not long ago. I need and want to study. I want to get my license. I'm not giving up. I want to get my license. Brother, don't give up. You can do it. You've got somebody in your corner fighting for you, praying for you. Bro, keep digging. You can do it. He said, if you haven't signed up, what are you waiting for? Highly recommend it. Appreciate that, JC. I will check that out, Miles, in the 2017, and maybe we'll address it next time, or you're welcome to email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail. He said, I will soon. Just found out about this smart man. Hey, guys, one thing about it, you guys see me operate in some of my zones, right? The code book, business, stuff like that. 
I, there's tons of stuff that I don't know. And I love not knowing stuff. For one, you're not responsible if you don't know. Meaning like I don't have to know every trade or this and that. I don't need to be responsible for everything on earth. And at the same time, if I do get to do anything in my life, I want to dedicate it to helping you become everything that you can be in life and in the electrical industry. And part of that, while we're here, I'm getting ready to jump off. I'm going to take about a 10-minute break. I didn't take a, ba- a break last night, and it really showed. I'm going to take about a 10, maybe 15-minute break, and I am going to go live on my Bible Coach channel. I'll go ahead give you guys an opportunity. We don't push anything on you on this channel, but I do want to let you know the hope that's in me. So if you will go to YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and go here right now. If you guys have any more questions before we get off, go ahead and drop them. And I'm going to go here, and I will give you my live stream share link. And you can actually wait for me. if you Not wait for me, but if you want to wait uh, at any time, you can click on that link. And I'll be live in, uh, here in about 15 minutes after we stop to on my Bible Coach channel, which we talk about the Bible, which is a cool channel. So if you're enjoying this, maybe you'll enjoy that. If you want to go, just come check it out. That would be cool. And let me share that link with you guys. I think there is a share link from this page. There sure is. I'm going to share that with you. Let's jump back over here. Wherever it is. I drive my wife nuts with all my tabs. I'll have a thousand tabs open and a thousand emails. I don't know if I ever delete my emails. But anyways, appreciate you. Good audio. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, I don't even want to try to pronounce it. We're going to call him FN. Appreciate you, bro. And a cool last name, by the way. I've just got... Man, I wish I had a cool name. My name's Perry Heider. So it's not a real cool name. What about like, I got a guy in my class right now. His name's Vinny. I'm like, Vinny, what's your name? It's Vinny. I mean, I just, I mean, that, that would be a cool name. Long story short, I hope you guys had a good night. I hope that you learned something tonight. I know there's a little more fluff when we're live on, on most of my videos. If you're new to my channel, it's process after process after process. I don't want to waste any of your time. If you watch a 45-minute video of mine, you're going to get 45 minutes or 44 minutes worth of juice. I like to have a little bit of fun, but when we're live, it's really just me and you sitting at the coffee table. What a time that we live in that we can get together like this. If someone's willing to take the time and take the effort to get on, log in, and learn, Man, you can learn in just an amazing way. We can interact live. I appreciate you, Ron, bro. Let me know. Email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. I'll put it in here for you. Let me know who you want to give one to. Electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. I'm going to ask you guys a favor. I've still got 25 of you with me. If you could, could you share this with a friend? And it's not to build me up, but it's to help more people. I want to see more people helped. And I love how slow my channel's grown. You guys see it at 40,000 subscribers now. It has grown so slowly. All of my things in life, all my endeavors that have grown very slow, lasted a very long time. Slow growth is a good thing. Meteoric growth worries me. I would be scared to death. This channel has grown so slow, but it's grown very steady and it's grown, and it will last. That's what I care about, lasting stuff. I don't want to be shot up and let down. That seems like, I mean, that that's everywhere. I like slow growth. So if you could do me a favor, if this channel is impacting you, if you could tell someone today, text them, say, hey, check this dude out. He's a nut, he's goofy, but he cares about us. I'd rather have somebody goofy that cared about me than somebody that wasn't goofy that didn't, okay? So you guys say, hey, check this guy out. He wants the best for us. He's rooting for us. I hope, you know, it's a little bit of encouragement. If you've not seen the Motivation Mondays, I'm just going to go ahead and give you guys the link. I don't want you guys to miss this. On Monday, we dropped the Motivation Monday. And it was fire. Not going to lie to you. Motivation Monday. The The two Code Tuesdays from yesterday was really good too. But I want you guys to hear this. If you did not hear Motivation Monday this week, you got to go check it out. What's going on, Mohammed? What's up, bro? Nick Bo, he says, I'll help you make it grow. I have a lot of electrical girl bros. Man, I greatly appreciate it. You guys often, uh, you know, ask, you know, how can you give back or how can you help? I don't want anything directly, although, uh, Rombo, I appreciate the $10. We, we put it toward, you know, paying the light bill and keeping things going. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but, you know, people ask me all the time. I, just go out and win is my number one response. Any of you that are watching right now, if you've ever asked me, oh, well, well what can I do or how can I pay you? I, I almost always say go out and win. But if you really want to help me, tell somebody. 
let us interact with them. Let, you know, let us touch their life. Let us teach them something. That's how you can help me more than anything. I started this thing out and I said, if we can help one person get their electrical license, then we've won. And in the first semester of teaching this in-person class, one got their license. You know, and there was more, and there ended up being more. But once we showed the proof of concept, and now thousands have got their electrical license all across the United States and around the world. So I'm just so thankful to be a part of your journey. So if you really want to help me, you can pray for me, and you can also uh, you can tell somebody. Tell somebody about it. Share it. Share it on your YouTube. Share it on your Facebook. Share it somewhere. It's not to build me up. It's to impact more people because I am the electrical code coach and my bargain is that these videos will add value to you and you will in turn add value to others. If there's anything you ever need from me, you can email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it. Y'all, we're going to sign off for tonight. I appreciate all the comments, all the support. Uh, Ronbo, get a hold of me and let me know who you want to give that free lifetime membership to. We're going to do a buy one, give one all the way till 12, 15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to buy a lifetime membership, just let me know. Miles said, appreciate the pro version. I'm an inspector in South Florida and your videos have helped me interpret the code better. I appreciate that. I love touching the inspectors. I love being a part of their journey. Appreciate you. And thank you very much. Miles, email me and we'll talk about that code, especially if you're an inspector, and we will dive that in. I'm sure that I could soak in a lot from you about pools with as many as you guys do in Florida. So if you felt inclined to text me or email me so me and you could interact, I bet you know a lot about pools that would add a lot of value to me if you felt like that was something that you were feeling called to do. I'm going to wait about 15 minutes. Appreciate you, Mohammed. Man, appreciate you guys so much. I'm going to wait about 15 minutes. I've got the link in the, the chat here to go over to the Bible Coach if you want to check it out. I don't push anything on anybody. I just want to see you guys win on every level. Give me about 15 minutes. We're going to go live on it. Let's go ahead and get to it.